Hello everybody, 7.07 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 24th, 2019, I'm told. I've got way too much material in front of me, while at the same time, I have got, uh, we're on uh, page three of the digital document written by Lance Owens on Joseph Smith and Kabbalah. And it is currently queued up to his uh, section on the Prophet and Freemasonry. Now, I know this section here is on the Prophet and Freemasonry. However, some of the earlier sections uh, delved not only by the author, but by myself into the connections to him and Kabbalah and mystical practices and all of those various expressions listed by this author, Lance Owens, um, having uh, more direct or in some cases perhaps indirect relationships to Kabbalah, which if they are incorrect, they certain or um, um, indirect, they certainly do seem to be uh, very direct outcroppings of uh, some of the expressions that seem to have come just before them or around the same time. History is such a remarkable web of complexity that distilling it down is uh, one of the highest uh, forms of intellectual educational expression. And it's certainly not uh, it's, it's certainly not a talent that should be minimized. Uh, however, uh, I do have to restate that concerning this paper by Lance Owens, and the more I get to understand uh, Kabbalism and the outcroppings of it, which in and of itself is quite a rather large discipline, so I do beg you to be uh, forgiving with me in my ignorance, because unfortunately, when looking back down the annals of time and what resources we have available, uh, it seems like the greatest resource of any individual in the face of that is ignorance, which is not necessarily a bad thing if it's going to fuel the um, the search for absolute truth in these things. And I know that uh, many people would assert that these truths can be subjective, and uh, even the most uh, sincere, heartfelt, truthful researcher can fall victim to that subjectivity, because after all, we are, I am one man, one mind, looking at these things often very prayerfully, by the way, uh, knowing my limitations uh, intimately, that uh, I, I cannot sort through this without the Spirit of Truth guiding me through it. And uh, if, if I try to get through it in any other way, I am going to falter and make mistakes. So, in addition, I know I have this in front of me, and look, this this is actually concerning Owen's document. This this is the last page. These are very long pages, by the way. But um, there are some there are some things that I think should be gone over before we move on. And and why is because we're getting closer and closer and closer to home. I am not looking at necessarily the full expression of, of the church, uh, of the LDS uh, organization today. Uh, and the reason I stop myself from saying church and organization is because far too much today calls itself church, the church. And, and that absolutely includes uh, all, everything considered evangelical, okay? Now, I, I'm not. I don't have my radar just on LDS or Mormons, uh, you know, like some some type of Hanegraaff, Martin-esque um, <laughs> polemics uh, apologist. I, I really don't. This is just taking, I had to take a look at this. This 
was integral in getting to a point in front of it, which is seeing if the connections are there. Do we have the basis for, uh, for drawing strong connections? from possibly Smith and his associates, however close or broad, that would, that would justify us in saying, you know, I think there are connections present that maybe uh, heretofore nobody has talked about at length. Connections maybe that uh, have to do with the underbelly of the infrastructure of what was governing the United States at this time, uh, however fledgling it may have been as compared to today. We have to see, are there connections to that underbelly? Because that underbelly was in existence from the start. There may have been different uh, atmospheres at that time than today, although I don't know how much things have changed. That may be something that uh, perhaps more light can be cast upon as we go, but you know the underbelly concerns, like if we look at the laws being passed today, and, and these laws, they want to call them laws. They're not laws, they're code. They're code of a corporation. And they look at everybody out there, every, everybody in the United States that lives in their, their imposed zip codes, by the way, they, they consider them as part of that corporation, that they are subject to that corporation from the 14th Amendment on. So they're passing so-called laws today. Now, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, they were passing bills and acts. Um, mostly that were implemented by Congress. Congress existed at the federal level to, it was supposed to, okay, this is, this is the sort of the official story. They were there to facilitate uh, commerce between the states, between the autonomous states. And, and at this time, of course, the states would have been far more autonomous. And that, of course, would be one reason that might attract a Smith and followers group from one area to another because the states were autonomous. They were distinctly different. There were territories out there that, that weren't under the, the, the burdens of law that, that we find all of the states now that are in this oppressive federal union to be within. So there's, there's, all kinds of, there's all kinds of various factors that we have to look at uh, that well, some people might consider secondary to the, the source information that I'm going over in this document, but I don't find it as that way at all. This is all, this is all very primary, and all, and all of it should, should if, uh, if some of my theories concerning this are correct, we should see some very clear connections once we're past this and can move forward into um, maybe what would be considered secondary or tertiary things, which I don't think are. But they may appear that way at first. So in light of what was going over last time, Kabbalah, thinking about Kabbalah, okay? <clears throat> Kabbalah is something that most people don't really know about. Now, why is that? And I would uh, assert that that is because Kabbalah <laughs> uh, has been occulted. And most of what you'll find concerning Kabbalah today online, unless you're willing to go through the literary channels that one must go to, they're not easy. Um, most of the time you can't find things online that you're going to be able to pull some real strong stuff from. It oftentimes takes finding things that, uh, well, a lot of materials that have to be bought, some that have to be tracked down. A lot of these things are not just going to be, they're not just going to be offered on Amazon for sale, for crying out loud. You're not going to find too many good, um, reviews, you know, on sites like Goodreads. 
and there's a reason for it. I mean, if we're talking about the occult, then of course that there's going to be a lot about Kabbalah that is occulted. I mean, consider the fact that, um, for instance, the Talmud that that is unredacted as it stands. We're we're talking about the cop copies that the rabbis will will have, will use, and will absolutely guard. They, they're not going to be offered out there for for sale to the goyim and and getting a hold of these copies is very difficult now that in and of itself the fact that unfortunately if you want to look for these source works you, you have to start looking with a knowledge that uh, <laughs> they're so sanitized the um the information coming from uh, apologists for various sects of Judaism that's going to be sanitized. Um, whatever documents that you, you, you think you can find and go over that, that, that may be directly from uh, these books may be heavily redacted. We have to go into it with, with just that as, as kind of a pre-existent knowledge. And there's so much to research that involves just thinking and looking between the lines <clears throat> and tracing veins of thought and action down through history to location to people there are I'm not going to be able to get into this this time. This is going to have to come actually a little bit later when we look at uh, a key figure in the Navu years. Um, we're going to have to look at some things that would be, as I would consider them, letters and creeds that I believe there's enough weight behind for all of us to consider them as something that became very universal and very key in movements that have transpired secretly at a worldwide level that have absolutely influenced the history of the world. And we're going to look at two figures, not in that depth, but kind of briefly, because this is laying a little bit of groundwork um, to, to get us to the point where we can continue to examine Smith's writings, uh, what part Kabbalism, occult practices, <laughs> had to do with this even in the early years and and those two big heavy hitter figures that we we cannot get by without looking at are going to be a Sabbatai Zevi and B Jacob Frank okay <clears throat> so I'm gonna give you a quick a uh, couple of quick one two threes on these guys I'm not spending serious time on these two because it's not necessarily about them some would make it more so it's not. Uh, I, I think there's there's broader ideas that we can learn here, and always keeping in mind that um, I can't stress this enough. Most of the information that you're going to find, even from sites that definitely seem to be more critical, um, are going to kind of be sanitized. And a lot of these sources, they're not trying to be exhaustive, and they're not trying to be controversial either. So. We'll start with Sabbatai Zevi, and he's a funny one because even the spelling of his name, in my opinion, is so Kabbalistic. And what do I mean by that? Kabbalah, K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H. Kabbalah, C-A-B-A-L-A. -A -A. Kabbalah, Q-A-B-B-A-L-A. -A -A. Sometimes with an H, sometimes not. The funny thing about that all the different ways it's been spelled. You could say that it actually just is probably an outcropping of all of the very um, the various languages of all of its various adherents uh, down through the years. But funny enough, it so echoes the confusion of languages that seems to be such a really a central underlying core theme not only of Kabbalists, Masons, Rosicrucians, and I would have to currently uh, identify Rosicrucians as being the the chief figures uh, behind 
the the worst confusion of languages that I know of to happen in our modern times, which is the invention of modern day English. And we can go over that sometime. I'd love to. Um, but there is this inherent confusion. Oh, maybe not by the adepts, but they understand that uh, to project continual confusion. Like, for instance, me trying to do searches just for information on Sabbatai's Evi was very, very difficult because, first off, of all of the variant spellings of his name, for crying out loud. Now, it's going to tell us in the freedictionary.com, just real quick and succinct, about Sabbatai Zevi. Uh, living from 1626 to 1676, Jewish mystic and pseudo-messiah, founder of the Sabbatean sect from uh, Smyrna, after a period of study of Lurianic Kabbalah, which is important, and they say see Luria, Isaac ben Solomon, <clears throat> and he's also called um, Isaac Luria. Uh, and you'll see why. I got another document up. He became deeply influenced by its ideas of imminent national redemption. In 1648, 1648, he proclaimed himself the Messiah, named the year 1666 as the millennium, and gathered a host of followers. In 1666, he attempted to land in Constantinople, was captured and to escape death, embraced Islam. Nevertheless, the influence of the Sabbatean movement survived for many years. It had secret adherents in the 18th century and was revived under Jacob Frank. The name is also spelled, and then they give us another spell. It's spelled in a lot of different ways. Now, I find it very interesting that they actually said, never, nevertheless, even though he embraced Islam, nevertheless. Well, not nevertheless. Not nevertheless. And that's one of the sanitations, whether it be conscious or unconscious. No, uh, in, in fact, I believe that based on all of the uh, actions I've seen by what can be called organized Jewry, and we have to keep something in mind. The thing to keep so at the forefront of, of what we're perceiving, thinking, looking at, and expressing is this. Because you know that with uh, with these codes and rules that uh, uh, Donald Trump, the president of the corporation of the United States over in that 10 square mile district of Washington, D.C., uh, is going to uh, give a little bit more free reign, uh, they perceive, uh, concerning pogroms against anybody who would wish to look into history, would wish to look into these people who are running things, these these occult, these satanic people, and that's who's running things, make no mistake whatsoever. Now, the funny thing is, now, are they running things behind the, um, the you know, the name of, of Jews and Jewry? What, what does that name have to do with with them, the the people at the top, the people in the middle, their adherents, the common self-identified Jews, and keep also in mind that Jews is, even today, even today, it's very misleading. There are people of various distinctly different races self-identified as Jews. And you have to understand that that's really based on everything we can learn in the Bible about the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Um, that's not a possibility, especially when we look at the law and what is allowed in the law as far as even marrying outside of their race and how long it is in various cases before a person can be considered once again as a representative of their tribe. Okay? So these things are an impossibility. However, we have become so dumbed down, and that's no accident either, that we don't realize these things. And the only way that we're going to get an accurate picture of history, how we've gotten to where we're at, and what's going on today, is if we are not muzzled 
when we try to discuss these things and bring them into the light. Just as Yosho or Mashiach did, everything was brought into the light. He did nothing and said nothing in secret. <laughs> He did speak in mysteries, but remember, those mysteries he spoke in were not for everybody, but it was given only to the children to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. So, of course, this is the this is the new um, this is the new censorship. This is the new censorship that they've built up through a lot of sneaky methods. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they get these dumbed down people, they get uh, these, these SJWs, they get these people who are not thinking with their head, but they're thinking 100% with their heart. <laughs> oh, and, you know, they're able to spread these ideas from decades ago about hate speech. If you talk in a certain way, it's... It's hate speech, and you know, it always was that people had more common sense than that. And they said, you know, free speech is free speech, whether it offends people or not, because they've been saying all kinds of things that offend my people, that offend my racial type, and, oh, who cares about that? Who cares? You deserve to be offended. You're privileged. Though I've never known any privilege. And most of the people I know in my racial type, um, there are some that know privilege. And most I know are the common salt-of-the-earth blue-collar folks. They didn't know any privilege. But don't get me wrong. It's not like it, nobody in my racial type knows privilege. Come on. There, there are those in, in every racial category that know plenty of privilege. You know, let's, let's just keep it real for a minute. Now, uh, in addition to Zabatai, we've got Jacob Frank. Now, remember... Uh, Zevi was 1626 to 76, and they said he was then succeeded by Jacob Frank. They did say that even though under pressure he converted to Islam, nevertheless, his followers uh, continued and thrived. Well, that's not a nevertheless. They continued to thrive because there was there, I don't think for the first time, keep that in mind. That's why I went through all of this about you know, four, five, six, seven, I mean, different races that are, are self-identifying as Jews today. And then what we can learn from Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9, how we can apply it. And then once we apply it, um, what we can fill in concerning the blanks from this time back. And yeah, we don't know how many years it was. <sighs> I can't believe the 2000 year uh, mainstream. I, I really can't. Okay. I'm, I'm not an adherent or subscriber necessarily to Fomenko. He's got some good ideas. I'm not an adherent and subscriber to Illig and Nemitz and Scott. They have good ideas. They definitely one thing they do is they all serve as great reference works for us to do some thinking. And that's one of the best things. So we could look back when we look at something like Zevi. Uh, becoming a, a convert to Islam. I don't think that was a new thing. I just think that was one thing that could not go without recording. It was obviously recorded and passed down, could not be suppressed, and it was so widespread. And the thing to keep in mind about this is that it, it is not like it... It was not a, a shameful thing. In fact, what it became was it, it became a, a very, I think, a very integral part of these movements past that like specifically Jacob Frank and as I said we're going to we're going to have to get into certain letters and creeds um, uh, spread about w within these circles um, that really gave license and a direction to this thing that calls itself organized Jewry, no matter who these people are. Because, you know, I have to say, echoing the sentiment of Michael Hoffman, at least on this subject, because I don't believe, I, I absolutely don't agree with, with his theology, his Catholic theology whatsoever. And he would consider people who believe certain things that I do as like the heart of darkness. But one thing I have to echo from him is the fact that he has challenged Judaics, as he calls them, prove, prove your direct link to the house of Judah. 
because all of those records, as it's said in even popular mainstream history, was supposedly destroyed by Titus in the first century A.D., right? So whether that popular history is right or wrong, they've got that to deal with. They've got that to surmount, and they never have. So they can't prove this. Uh, this is all based on absolute conjecture. So even to say something like anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism laws, based on conjecture, okay? Because we have a group of people claiming to be a historical, biblical group of people wherein they can't even prove this. So that brings us up to Zephi and his uh, supposed revolution, his landing in Constantinople in 1666, his capture, his pressing into converting to Islam, his agreement to convert into Islam, which we know they were doing far before that in Spain with Mohammedans and anyways. So then they say this is laying the ground to Jacob Frank and his Frankists. There is not even time to go into Jacob Leibowitz, who became Jacob Frank, his followers, Zevi and Frank, and all the perversions within their ranks that they proliferated, and the various stories that there are out there about the more orthodox rabbis and Jewish leaders fighting these guys, them being so fringe, but they were capturing the heart of the more middle class, lower class Jews of Europe. And you hear so many things from so many people in so many directions. Like I said, it's very complex. I can say this, though. There are a number of people that have written, con contemporary people that have written on this and are currently <clears throat> doing a lot of speaking on this. This is my opinion. You can take it with however many grains of salt you want. But I can say from the bottom of my heart, please, please, do not put too much stock into the work of a man named Christopher John Birkness. I believe that he was compromised from the start. I have my reasons for believing that. It is my opinion. You can take it with one to a million grains of salt if you wish. Um, but the thing is, with Kabbalah, we have some things that we can we can take from Kabbalah. Now, I pulled up one thing concerning Kabbalah from somebody who was just basically said to be your average Orthodox um, Jew. And, and then I pulled up one thing on Kabbalah that actually is more from the Chabad Lubavitch school. Okay. Uh, said to be extremely different uh, schools of thought. Uh, I don't know. The more I read on uh, tenets of Judaism, the more I see more consistent veins running through it than inconsistent ones. Uh, keep a few things in mind concerning Kabbalah. And remember this, that both Sevi and Frank were, Kab were Kabbalists, um, just as they said uh, concerning uh, Sevi and his... Um, his study from Lurianic Kabbalah. Same thing with Frank. Okay. Um, now, somebody who would would at least tell the world that that they were uh, the run run of the mill um, Orthodox Jew, commenting on what Kabbalah means to uh, just to Jewry. Okay. Um, <sighs> They would say one uh, concerning the Torah. They would say the, the Torah consists in two parts as given to Moses on Mount Sinai. One, the written part, okay, um, called the uh, Kamashe Sifrei Torah, the five books of Torah, five books of Moses. Moses uh, two, the oral law or Mishnah, which was written down after the destruction of the second temple, so it would not be forgotten or altered through inaccurate transmission. How thoughtful of them to do that a couple thousand years after it was given to Moses because they managed to, um, I guess, relay it for a couple thousand years, but then they had to write it down after that because um, I guess their powers of uh, remembrance became very poor. Now it goes on to say the rest of the Tanakh or Torah Nevi'im, which is the prophets, and Ketuvim, which is the writings, it came later. The origins of Kabbalah 
are in there. They are in there. That's the origins of Kabbalah. Remember, Kabbalah is supposed to be uh, like the Mishnah and Talmud um, commentary, right? On the Bible. That's what they say. That's how they um, give it veracity and authentication. And keep something in mind that um, our descendants, the, <coughs> excuse me, the Israelites and the uh, Judahites, they were practicing all kinds of um, foulness, which is what's really encapsulated in these books here, because they were practicing um, the, uh, the whoredom of the nations around them, starting with all the Canaanites that they didn't expel, and then the various groups that were moved in by various nations that conquered uh, Israel and then Judah later on. So the description of the heavenly chariot is considered one of the major mystical portions and from which a lot of Kabbalah is learned. Some of the claim that the entire book of Job is one literally secret writing. It's referring to Kabbalistic meanings. They consider Job the earliest Kabbalistic book written. Later, the Sefer uh, Ha Yasod was written, which was then complemented with a far more complete work, the Zohar. But these books are not complete. Some things are not written down. These form the basis of what is known as Lurianic Kabbalah, named after Rabbi Isaac Luria. Um, that's actually uh, Isaac ben Solomon. So these people, they have a very common habit of changing their names. That has not stopped. Um, it was the most common thing in early Hollywood for Jews to change their names, always changing their names. Why would they need to do that? Uh, of course, the answer you're going to get is because they've been so persecuted, which I'm not sure if they're placing the R correctly in that. It was actually prosecuted, but... Um, Anyways, so you have this Lurianic Kabbalah. Uh, and keep in mind that they are saying that a lot of Kabbalah, because as we learned from Lance Owens, uh, there are portions of it written down, said to be uh, pseudepigraphal, but as most people will admit, there are these uh, like large portions of Kabbalah not written down at all, and there's still, in a sense, a tradition or a an occult or a collection of occult thought and practices that you're not going to find written down in Kabbalah, Mishnah, Torah. And I believe that those sorts of things are the true occult satanic heart of these things. Uh, they go on to say a competing school of Kabbalah is based around the teachings of Baal Shem Tov, who is an important figure as well, the originator of the Hasidic movement and summarized in the Tanya, written by Rav Shinur Zalman of Liadi, the founder of the Chabad Lubavitch movement. These are nefarious figures, folks. Chabad literally stands for... Uh, Chokmah, uh, Binya, and Da'at, the three main sephirot in the Tree of Life, as taught by Baal Shem Tov. Now, um, these four points are actually kind of important when they say, uh, when Jews study Torah, it is looked at in various ways, and in each way a word or even a letter can mean something different or teach something different. This is so important. Don't let this go without great attention. 1. Peshat. This is the plain, easily understood meaning. Yeah, right. Sometimes even this is difficult. That's what the author said. <sighs> Point two is halakhic, the legal interpretation. So taking the legal definition of a word rather than its straight meaning. This is really just a subset of pshat since they are both plain meanings, though what is learned may differ. And of course all the meanings of their word, their entire lexicography is based on Masoretic Hebrew that their rabbis um, dictated. 
and is is what is it's the very thing that uh, that, that Christians are to this day using people that are Christian identity will fight me tooth and nail to use their pronunciations and their lexicon that they got handed down to them from rabbis I sometimes cannot even understand that level of insanity however point three Ramesh the uh, alluded to meanings this is where you get the <clears throat> alluded to meanings in the oral law meanings of the passages some of these are agado more likely morality stories or fables though always meant to teach others are halakhic and give guidance on the laws and then the sod secret this level of study is the most difficult and is not common studying at this level is usually only done by a student and teacher in an, in in a one-on-one -on -one session and is not taught in large groups or classes the reason for this is that the teacher has to make sure that the student fully understands what is being taught or the student may be led astray and we don't want that a story in the Talmud Masekta Hagiga is told of Rabbi Akiva, one of the greatest sages who, using Kabbalah from the lessons derived from the vision of the Merkava or divine chariot, ascended to view the world to come with four students, each a great sage in their own right. One student who was pure did not guard himself and died from the view. A second went mad. A third died, and the fourth became an apostate and started his own religion, dualistic in nature. <laughs> yeah, because we can't see any of that all through uh, Talmudic and Kabbalistic teachings. That was me. The Talmud brings this story to teach one that this should never have been done in a group. I see. And two, as a general warning, that studying Kabbalah is not for everyone. And they always have such cute stories. So let us now look at Sad. So this is the secret. They say this is the secret portion of Torah. See, these people don't study Torah. They don't they don't have the Aliyim that that we do. This is very, very different very very different this this is why this is why check the book of Nehemiah and Ezra check when all those people all around came to them and said oh you're building the temple in the wall we will build the temple with you because your Aliyim is our Aliyim and they answered them they said no sorry it isn't for you to do this with us it is only for us and therein is that sense of exclusivity which today is taught that there, there's no exclusivity what are you talking about all are welcome all are welcome all are welcome uh, especially those that we can put on the rolls for uh, for getting us uh, better loans with uh, with our banks as a 501c3 corporation we want those more people in everybody is welcome you're all the same in the eyes of the Lord the Bible doesn't teach that either so now let us look at sod the area in which Kabbalah is found and that I think should be a huge red flag in and of itself Kabbalah is found in the secretive teachings of Torah right a the earliest written work of Kabbalah is generally stated as being the book of Job which is just now I would say that's insane however if you have had to you've been forced to look at uh, many of the passages in Job and take away the Masoretic Nakud that is Hebrew and look at it in the purest form you possibly can which is Obri and when you look at it in that way you have so much work to do even in one verse because of how much everything is hidden you're going to see that Job is probably it might actually be the book of the Bible that has the the largest amount of in my opinion mistranslated proper nouns and well I, I, I separate them into two categories specific objects and proper objects 
Specific objects would be, say, animals, trees, you know, like flora and fauna and, and things like that. And then proper objects would be people's names, places' names, so on. So it's interesting that they believe that uh, the, the earliest uh, Kabbalistic work that they can get these secret meanings out of is the book of Job. The rabbis do not view this book literally. They don't view it literally. Of course it's not literal, right? It just says that it literally happened. Now, yes, there's, there's a lot of poetic, um, verbose passages. That's true. But that doesn't mean that it did not literally happen. Okay? There's a difference. You can have tons of um, allegorical speech. You can have a lot of poetic talk and dialogue. And something really have happened. Maybe back then, the common man, and I don't think Job was common man, because the Bible didn't say he was a common man. He was actually a very, uh, very wealthy man. Very had to be a very well educated man, and so were his friends as well. I would think, right? Birds of a feather. They say the rabbis don't view this book literally, but what do they? But rather as an allegory in which many Kabbalistic insights are taught. Point B, the earliest oral source of Kabbalah, is stated as being the Sefer Yetzira, which tradition says was authored by Abraham and passed down orally until it was written down around 200 CE since it was in danger of being corrupted or forgotten. And I would think if he had authored a book, especially a book of Kabbalah, uh, Yahweh wouldn't have uh, neglected to have Moses write that down. Oh, but I forgot. All of this is based on all kinds of stuff that Yahweh told Moses, but he handed down just through oral tradition for a couple thousand years till they had to write it down after the temple was destroyed because, I don't know, do you? Now, point C, and i got to get some chapstick on. I'm talking too fast, my lips are drying out. Point C, the vision of the divine, divi, divine, divine chariot. That's actually point C. Obviously, that's very important. Point D, the Zohar. Tradition states that this was a compilation of lessons that Rebbe Shimon Bar Yochai collated and organized while he was hiding from the Romans around 200 Common Era because it is in the realm of Sod. Of course, they won't use AD because they hate Christ. Because it, it is in the realm of Sod, that secretive realm, People were always reluctant to write down, but it was finally written down around the 1600s. And that brings us back to um, what uh, Lance Owens is saying, but he puts it actually a lot earlier than the 1600s. They think that there was a lot of these copies just floating around, and that it was finally written down, of course, remember, in a pseudepigraphical way. Now, this person goes on to say, who studies it? Basically, the majority of Orthodox Jews accept Kabbalah as worthwhile studying, though there is a rule that we never alter the Halakha, Jewish law, because of what is found in the Kabbalah. <sighs> the Torah written in oral takes primacy. I am sorry, I look at that as uh, absolutely scrubbed. I don't believe that that is a position that the rabbis take. Now, they will take that overt position, correct? However, we can see that through their plethora of writings, uh, many of them, of course, they keep secret, that uh, they always have a way of getting leaked out one way or another into the light. And I love that, because everything is going to come out to the light one day, folks. Everything. Everything is going to come out into the light one day. All of their works will be exposed into the light one day. Amazing to me that they fight so hard for this darkness. They want to uh, cover everyone in this darkness, and they want to cover all of their works in this thick darkness. But it's all going to, be come, out, it's all going to come out into the light one day. It's, it's just, that just proves how literally insane they are. Now, this author goes on to say, Judaism is focused on action, not belief. Okay. <laughs> it's focused on action and not belief. Do you know that there can be no action if there is not belief? Do you know that? 
There cannot be action without belief. It's impossible. Prove me wrong. It's focused on action, not belief, uh, they say, in doing, not in studying for the sake of studying. As such, the focus has always been on learning. Is that double speak or what? The focus has always been on learning the Torah first, together with all the laws and how to perform them properly before studying it, blah, 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 anything to do with the Kabbalah. Uh, <clears throat> thus, for a long time, no Kabbalah was written down, and it was only directly taught by teacher to student in a one on one fashion. Uh, even today, the written works of Kabbalah do not contain everything. You bet they don't. They, uh, they're major elements. Uh, that are only taught. Okay. And that's enough from them. Uh, because I'm 45 minutes in. And I haven't even gotten to the Chabad Lubavitch portion. And there was one more portion after that. I'm not going to get to this section in the reading today. I will next time. And then we're going to have to take another break video like this to go through, as I said, those specific letters and creeds. They have so much to do with the main subject that we're, we're learning. So it's just, this is a necessity. So look, I'm not going to read much from this Chabad Lubavitch site. First off, it would kind of turn into it would turn into a farce. There's a lot out there that's said about Chabad Lubavitch, um, and I think a lot of commentators on Chabad Lubavitch. First off, they do they have a tendency to, when they comment on it, turn it farcical. Now, part of that is and I'm doing I'm doing as much as I can to curtail some of that. Now I come built in with a certain sarcastic and satirical sense of humor and oftentimes that is appropriate and sometimes it's not. Here's the deal. With as much rhetoric as there is uh out there from uh, in my opinion, um, very clear um, uh, agents and assets, people who are agent provocateurs and honeypots, okay? They are, they are consciously um, acting as if they are the voice of a great amount of people, and they're not. People like them and people like all these other agents and provocateurs, disinformation agents, uh, psyops, they are the very people who have spread the foundation being used in this very day and time as I speak by entities like YouTube to, to perform pogroms on um, vaccination education channels on history education channels on scientific education channels you see it's just like flat earth theory there were so many disinfo agents that led the charge at the beginning and they laid uh, uh they laid a false foundation and that's what these people do so you know these these honey pots and agent provocateurs and uh, disinfo people have already laid this sort of circus rhetoric about all of these things to where if anybody comes along and they want to talk about any of it seriously they've already got a dark cloud hanging over their head because that was the plan from the start so I'm not going to turn this into some kind of uh, a silly circus when I go through some of these points. And the reason that I'm not going to spend much time with this Chabad Lubavitch is, first off, uh, this, um, this, this supposed Orthodox Jew, I think, laid out some of the key features to where we can understand Kabbalistic thought as applied to the Torah. And we're going to get into the Christianity aspect of it only briefly. But i got to mention this. This is from... A Chabad site. It's called Mashiach.ru slash English Kabbalah. It's very. It's essentially points uh, that they believe uh, about Kabbalah and and various teachings. Point eight. Where did monkeys come from? Monkeys, according to the Midrash, 
are a degraded form of some of the humans who participated in the construction of the Tower of Babel. Rabbi Chaim Vital writes that the monkey in its development occupies an intermediate stage between animals and man, quote, just as there are intermediate links between minerals and plants, corals and some rock formations which grow and multiply, between plant life and animals, in the Talmud there's a description of a dog whose umbilical cord grows from the ground and if it's severed the dog dies. Likewise, between animals and humans, there too exists an intermediate stage, which is the monkey. And between the Creator and His creation stands righteous men like Abraham. What they mean is righteous men like themselves. They consider themselves to be the only real men and everybody else falls into a strata below them. That's why they commonly, by themselves, when speaking among themselves, use words like Schwarza. Okay? <clears throat> and that's where I'll, I'll stop on that. Now, I do want to say a little bit just concerning about the Kabbalah from, from the outside. Okay, maybe something that hasn't been sanitized as much. And we're going to carry this forward a bit into masonry because what seems to be less arguable, if you want to say that it's arguable, for anybody who insists that it's still extremely arguable that J. Smith from early days and his family and associates had an intimate relationship with Kabbalah and its outcroppings. One thing that's far less arguable is that he did have a relationship with masonry and I just want to read a quick quote from a site called epiphanyoftruth.com they write Kabbalah is the mysticism Freemasonry is based on and they are inseparable the secret society is a system and order of controlling the participants through Kabbalah. You may think of Kabbalah as the software and Freemasonry as one of the hardwares to use and deliver it. And there are some good videos out there and still some decent sites and literature that you can find out there online though as I said I think what we're going to be, be looking at is that in time, because of the polemics that are being perpetrated and the pogroms being perpetrated against all non-Jewish peoples of the world, we're going to have to find that we are going to have to get these materials more in print form, which is a darn good idea from the start. Because in direct opposition to things like the Mandela effect, I do not believe that my books have ever or will ever change on the shelf. However, digital does and can because they have backdoored the entire internet. And, and, and besides their backdoors, there is a total control of all search engines and they can just by fiat decide what things are controversial enough to just block them. That's right. But you can get porn as easy as punching in a search on something entirely unrelated. How on earth can it be that we live in a nation that is literally passing laws that we just can't talk about certain things or certain people or certain situations? So they say, and that it is a, an absolute affront to the Bill of Rights and is a totally unrighteous act. However, however, pornography, pornography, which absolutely breaks families and breaks minds, is protected under free speech. People wake up. Uh, a final portion. Uh, okay, first thing, I'm going to make a statement, 
and it will be in part up to you to prove or disprove this this statement is that besides for all the the Hellenism and other uh, various uh, nefarious shades that I see things like Masoretic bringing to our understanding of the Bible Hellenism being more in either the New Testament Greek or peppered throughout uh, what's called the Septuagint um, Kabbalah and unfortunately uh, a lot of Mishnah and Talmud has had a great very great very strong effect on modern Christianity now there is a false idea being taught by various historians Catholic historians and Protestant historians by the way if I get one of the names wrong and you haven't heard this person say this or you've heard this person say something directly in opposition to this you can correct me and please cite it uh, folks like E. Michael Jones uh, folks like Michael Hoffman uh, like uh, Ted Pike Tex Mars uh, guys like this will actually teach that um, it was Jews and Judaism that, uh, and the Catholic authors are going to say this more, that uh, directly opposed the holy doctrine, doctrine of the Trinity. And I find that to be utterly, utterly, provably false. Okay? There are today, um, there are today uh, Jews in certain sects of Judaism that, of course, argue against the Trinity because that is their um, that is their standard in in their belief system. There's there's one God. They oppose the Trinity. They they have to do this um, by way of just posturing, folks. However. Uh, it will be clearly seen in the Kabbalah that um, an idea of monotheism is actually opposed and an idea of plural theism is vouched for. Okay, So an idea that monotheism is a specifically Judaic thing is not true. There may be some that argue for it. I understand that. But you look in the writings and their teachings, and this is not true. Just do, uh, just do a, a an exhaustive study on their idea of Shekinah for one thing, and this idea of Adam Kadmon and man and God is something else. Now, uh, outside of that, now because people know. A lot of you that have been listening to me for a long time, you know that I'm not a Trinitarian. Those of you who are, don't pull your hair out, don't freak out, don't yell and scream at your iPhone for crying out loud. I'm not through a, a long, long course of study, okay? Which I'm not going to go into now, but know this, that Kabbalah, and you'll find, you can find this in very overt sources, Many people will actually point to Kabbalah as one of the great um, influencing factors that greatly strengthened the idea of Trinity as it is expressed in the church to this day. And you have to wonder, when some people come along, there are folks out there who will tell you they believe that the Catholic Church was infiltrated from the earliest of days. Forget about later days, because there are people that teach that it was actually the infiltration of the Catholic Church would have happened during maybe around the time of either the Sabbateans or the Frankists. Um, the people who believe that it was infiltrated from the earliest times um, would believe that it was... It was infiltrated as, as early as um, it, it, it coming into being, literally from the start. There are guys like uh, Edward Hendry, and no, I don't trust Edward Hendry, okay? Too, too, many, 
Too many documents, too much of a life actually spent writing legal documents for the FBI and other alphabet agencies for me to, to really trust the guy. Come on. Maybe, maybe he's all right, but when you have that kind of a history, no, you don't get my trust just out of the gate. Sorry about your luck. Um, now, he believes things like that, and if he believes things like that, and he has enough... Um, if he has enough factual information to prove that, then it could be further argued, further back, where did this doctrine of the Trinity come from? I don't see it taught in the Bible. So you can go to Mormonism.com. Mormonism.com will, will take you to other sites like LDS.org. Um, they do talk at length on just the front page of mormonism.com concerning what they believe. Um, there are uh, ex-Mormons out there that will tell you that a lot of this is again just um, overt public face stuff. And at the higher levels, that's when you start seeing the heavy Masonic influences. This isn't coming from me. This isn't my opinion. Okay? This is what I'm hearing from people who claim to be um, <clears throat> ex-Mormon, ex-LDS, that they have seen things like this, okay? Um, and it's going to be difficult because I can't read through, I can't read through, say, all of the 13 uh, statements de of declaration by Joe Smith. Um, a lot of this is, is actually, it's far too wordy for me to get into now and I don't want to make a number of these videos that are departures from literally reading from the document by Owens commenting on that and getting to our point however some of this uh, I'm afraid I, I just see as very necessary so it's probably just going to be most profitable if I uh, I read some of these basic statements that we can just find on mormonchurch.com okay about these basic beliefs rather than getting into various tenets written by Smith, at least not at this time. Now they will say, first, it's important to understand that every word spoken by a prophet is not necessarily doctrine, particularly in the earliest days of the church. Now, I'm sorry, I see you mixing apples and oranges right there. Uh, I consider that all the words of the prophets um, were we're doctrine, okay? We, we look at it, we form doctrine from it. We have many books of the prophets and then a number of prophecies that we can also see written down in the New Testament. However, they're going to make statements that I can agree with to a point, okay? Um, but them saying that, like, for instance, people considered like apostolic fathers and church fathers, uh, you're going to have to do some real convincing with me, and I don't think you're going to gain much ground that those people were necessarily prophets. I don't see anything that, that, that they wrote necessarily being any prophecy that necessarily came true. But they go on to say, in the beginnings, the church was run much more informally. People talked among themselves, and sometimes others took notes and published those conversations or informal speculations of church leaders. Now, they may be talking about the LDS church and not the church as what we should be seeing as the church ecclesia and actually being the congregation and that right there would open up a whole stinking can of worms because of the etymology word origins we would have to go to and establish who those people are but if they're talking about LDS uh, as in church I think what they're doing is they're leaving a lot of room for uh, things being open to interpretation and if you read for instance if you just went through and read these official declarations of theirs they got they have a lot of material of course on their uh, lds.org site really just tons um, you're gonna see that there's that's a real there's some real oddities there from what Smith wrote in the beginning and what things were practiced from the 1820s onward and into the um, Young days, uh, the Brig Brigham Young days, uh, to what was adopted in time over the years, um, certainly seems, as far as my opinion, 
pretty wishy-washy. I mean, if it was delivered by a prophet and it was solidified, and, and that's doctrine, and we're talking about um, something that is restitutional um, as opposed to revolutionary, because even that word kind of gives me heartburn, especially when people say that like Jesus was the greatest revolutionist when in fact um, he was uh, doing the very thing that, that we see prophetically in the Old and New Testament is going to be done in time, which is the restitution of all things. In fact, he is currently sitting at the right hand of the Father since he is called the Father's right hand in the Old and New Testament. He will sit at his right hand until the restitution of all things. And that means the purity of what was handed down to us the practice thereof, the understanding thereof, Resti restoration, not restitution, <laughs> restoration, which is absolutely what the Obrey Project is all about, restoration, absolutely not revolution, restoration. So I don't know how they can claim that there was this restoration of the first and pure ways when they seem to have changed their ways over and over and over again with the times and <laughs> based on federal and state laws and stuff. I mean, that's that's, that's pretty wishy-washy, really. I mean, is it not? Do you disagree? They go on to say because Mormonism focuses on continuing revelation and learning line upon line, in quotes, much of the doctrine was not yet known, but I thought it was. Uh, we're talking about, you know, you, you people call Smith the prophet. Smith the prophet, and, and he wrote the absolute founding articles uh, of LDS, you know? And, and you're going to say, but, but, but it's, it's con continuing revelation. Continuing revelation is fine, and they, they put this in the light. They say that, um, <clears throat> that, that they don't believe that 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 once um, the New Testament had been written and, and that you know Jesus as he's called was uh, died buried resurrected and then um, uh, the various apostles wrote what they wrote it was recorded it was put into book form uh, they said well we don't believe that you know prophecy or divine revelation stopped being given to people and hey you know what um, I'm open to that but uh, here's the thing. If you're going to call Smith a prophet, and you're going to call his writings prophetic, you're going to call them scripture and inspired, then you cannot down the road say, but, eh, you know, uh, maybe some of these things are subject to various changes and da -da 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 -da. you know, you can't do that. I'm sorry. If you can, then that wasn't inspired. I mean, some people would say, and I might be one of them, that with as much looseness of what were supposed to be utterly strong core doctrines, which were uh, from the beginning taught as the restoration of pure worship, if you are willing to take those things and actually change them up in time, depending on which way the wind blows, and that's exactly what I'm seeing there with what I've read so far. On the other page and this one, um, to me, that sounds like something no different than what they would call uh, Talmud and Kabbalah as being traditions. Traditions that, um, you know, in time they can be changed. They are oftentimes... Uh, through various rabbinic commentaries, ideas about them are changed. And remember, those things are commentaries on the pure scriptures. Um, and just that whole slippery slope is something I think to be avoided like the plague. Now this again, this just echoes this ping pong match. Uh, that I went on about with Lance Owens, and it seems to me, I mean, every time I have to read any LDS literature, it is, it's doublespeak. Get as mad at me as you want to, okay? The truth is the truth. It's doublespeak. 
They go on to say, however, the Bible assures us that God will do nothing except through his prophets. What it actually says, yeah, he does. He will do nothing lest he first tells it through, our, uh, through his prophets. And we've got so much of a bulk of material from the so-called Old Testament. Prophets, that is eschatological, that we have not yet understood. Well, let's turn our attention to that first, shall we? But they go on. This means that in order to prepare us for the return of Jesus Christ, another core doctrine of Mormonism, God must restore prophets to the earth. He did this when he chose Joseph Smith as his first prophet in the last days. Today, the church is led by Thomas S. Monson, the Mormon prophet. Does this not sound like just a string of... of of papacies? I mean, isn't everything that they say inspired? When they talk ex cathedra, and you can go from pope to pope to pope to pope, and they talk ex cathedra, and it's inspired, and you can go from rabbi to rabbi to rabbi to rabbi, and whatever they say, if it's just accepted as a whole by the power structure of Ju Judaicry however we're calling it these days. Is not that inspired? They say he did this when Joseph Smith, as his first prophet in the last days. Well, if he was the first prophet in the last days and he was leading in this re restoration of all things, why are you guys backed off on all of these doctrines of his? As I'm reading it, I, I'm not going to read it to all of you in here, but you can read it. I'll have it in the description. Now they, now they go into family and what, what they believe about family. The family is the one mother, family is one father. However, if you read their if you read their writings, you will see this was not always the case, and that people that they considered inspired prophets taught polygamy, okay? They change up depending on the way the wind blows. This is the same thing with what they had to say about races at one point in time and what they say about races since 1978 and since the Civil Rights Movement and other things. This is all politics. This all stinks to me like Roman Catholicism and, and Judaism. All right? Say what you will. Oh, well. Now, interesting enough, our, they write, Our stories begin when God created our spirits. We lived with him as spirits for a very long time, learning truth, learning to love God, and deciding what kind of person we wanted to be. Eventually, as is the case with children living at home, we could progress no further without leaving home and going out, quote, into the world, one God, and Jesus would prepare for us. He explained that when we want, or when we went there, we would lose our memory of our time with him because this journey was about faith. However, we would gain bodies and families, and the Spirit of Christ would go with us to help us recognize truth if we wanted to find it. Okay, do you remember that Owens pointed out that it is a Kabbalistic teaching that Adam did exist in spirit form before he was made into his body? However, the Bible says clearly in Genesis 2, that Yahweh Aliyim made the Adam in the garden, and then he breathed the spirit of life into his nostrils. Now, whether or not he had been pre existent in the lungs of Yahweh Aliyim and somewhere outside of that before that, that is never alluded to in the Bible. But that is quite similar to what we're learning about Adam Kadmon, the ideas of Adam Kadmon, and how essentially close Adam is to God, and this above and below sort of thing. Now, going on, now I'm going to cut into part of a paragraph here where it says, um, concerning grace, oh, and I have to read the whole thing, I'm sorry. God knew we would all sin, and he wanted to make it possible for us to return to him even when we did sin. He loves us and wants us all to make it back home. For this reason, he promised to send a Savior who would live on earth for a time, 
teach the gospel and take our sins on himself, saving us through grace. This grace would allow us to rise from the dead, repent, and make it back to God if we kept the commandments. Grace cannot be bought. We do not have in ourselves the power to bring about resurrection or forgiveness. However, the Bible is very clear that only those who keep the commandments and who repent of sins will be allowed to return to God. <sighs> it would take forever, of course, to unpack this. Well, longer than I got anyways. However, something I want to bring up is what I've already read from them just above on, on this page until now that revelation is an ongoing thing. They consider some people prophets at some times and then they change. They will literally change the LDS Church's official point of view of practices based on variant different things. Now, what exactly is considered commandments and is considered law and what they do? I mean, let's be honest. If there are things that are considered law in the LDS Church because of things that were spoken of and solidified by any various prophet from, I don't care if we're talking about yesterday is in February 23rd in the supposed year 2019, uh, back a few years, that it's, it's now been solidified uh, by the higher-ups. Is that considered law? Is that considered something that should and has to be done by them? to get their sins forgiven so that they can return to God in this spiritual state that they were once in before they came here? What exactly are we talking about in these keeping of these commandments? Because when you have so much of this blowing about of winds of doctrines, as I see it, I have to wonder what exactly are we talking about? Can that change as the higher-ups determine that it needs to be changed? And then if the adherence of Mormonism, if they don't change based on these uh, changing commandments of the leadership, can they then be excommunicated? Are they in sin? It sounds to me like they are. And wow. Then after uh, some statements that some, of course, I would have to agree with because they're biblical, others I don't really agree with, others I think the wording is actually a little bit too abstract to entirely understand at this point in time. Uh, after some of that, uh, we get into a bit at the end here that's interesting. Uh, they say life here on earth is not easy, but it is designed to allow us to have opportunities for growth. It allows us to seek out and find truth if at all possible. But of course, it is not possible for everyone. Some people live their entire lives never having heard of Jesus Christ, some because they lived before he was born, and some because the gospel simply never reached them. I'll tell you what, see, that's amazing. Um, I've heard that same thing in evangelicalism since I was a little kid, and I can't find that in the Bible. Over the centuries, theologians have debated what happens to those people. Would God unfairly punish them for something out of their control? Of course not. God is loving and fair, and he sent us here. This means he will give everyone a fair chance to accept or reject his gospel. Those who die without being given that opportunity will receive it after their death. Not a second chance, but a first chance, the only way a loving God would choose to do it. They can, just as we can, accept or reject Jesus Christ's teaching and accept the blessings and consequences of their choice. So, uh, I get to heaven. I haven't heard of Jesus Christ yet. Um, what's the deal? Is it a classroom setting? Is it a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing where they basically, you know, you know you died, you know you've been resurrected, right? Or are you going to be in a state where you think you're still alive? Will you go through some kind of, um, 
an interesting play acting sort of role like we might see in a movie where you think you're alive and you get a couple of uh, Mormon missionaries come knocking on your door Elder Smith Elder Jones we're here to talk to you about Jesus Christ and give you an opportunity to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior now you already died a thousand years ago however uh, your memory has been erased and now you're being put in a situation where you can choose to accept them now maybe everybody from the Old Testament is actually going to have to go through this too now I hope it's not one at a time or else that's gonna take forever and I know I'm being a smart aleck so don't remind me of that in the comments Duh! I didn't realize I was being a smart aleck I know I am um, and that sarcasm, it, it, it's, it's for a reason, and here's why. None of this is in the Bible. All of this is tradition. They justify what they're, they're, they're putting on this page by their, by their institution's tradition. They may change it tomorrow if their institution decides, just as Judaism does, just as Catholicism does, and I don't see in any way, shape, or form how that's godly because first off, there is no consistency then of what you can stand on. Okay? And I got to put this in. This is right at the end. Last paragraph, two, three sentences. And this really sums it all up. As you continue to study official church websites, Take note of what Mormons are being currently taught in their classes. The lesson manuals are all openly online. Those teachings are the core. Mormons are impacted only by core doctrines. Those taught by current prophets that affect our eternal salvation. God help us all those last four words were me that's all I can do today but I am going to continue with the prophet Freemasonry the reason I had to go through that stuff is because I had to go through that stuff it was a few things that I had to look into that I have been looking into in the meantime as I'm reading through this um, don't get on my back about saying those things either about the uh, the Kabbalah and and various you know sects and and ideologies behind Judaism Catholicism or Mormonism you know because look here's the thing if I see something that is hypocritical it's inconsistent or it doesn't make sense I'm gonna call it out it's what I do am I always right of course not but I'm always going to give you my most sincere opinion that I can and try to divide things as, as, as well as I can, okay? So anyways, I'm laughing right now. I just, I just had to pause it when I was trying to wrap it up there. You know, my son, he's, kind of, uh, he's, he's having, you know, a time. Anyways, uh, all right, so I'll be back pretty, pretty quick here with uh, continuing in the next section which is called the prophet and freemasonry pretty cool stuff so i'll see you guys next time bye